Hi, welcome. My name is Memphis. Thank you so much for attending this virtual event organized by WordUp Community Bookshop. During this event, feel free to add comments in the chat panel, which you can access by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, please click the Q&A button and put the questions there so that questions don't get lost in the chat. And if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to comment and we'll bring those comments into the chat on Zoom. A little bit about WordUp. WordUp is a bookshop and art space run by local residents, many of whom are volunteers. We started as a one month long pop-up shop in 2011, and then we stuck around due to overwhelming community demand. This past June, we celebrated our 10th birthday. We can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in Washington Heights, New York City. Shout out to the Heights. <laughs> we host events for all ages and sell used to new books in English and Spanish. And you can check us out at www.wordupbooks.com to shop and see other virtual and outdoor events that we have. You can also pick up a copy of tonight's book there. We are open Tuesdays through Fridays, 2 to 6 p.m., uh, 12 to 6 p.m., and Saturdays, 11 to 5 p.m. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce the folks that we have joining us tonight. So firstly, I'm going to introduce Sericia J. Fennell. She is um, the editor of the collection, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed. Ooh, so excited to have you here with us. Uh, we have E.B. Zaboy with us, who is one of the contributors. Uh, she wrote Haitian Sensation. We also have Zakia and Jamal with us. She wrote Cuban Imposter Syndrome. And we are also joined, um, sorry, something just went very, very wrong. <laughs> we're also joined by Janelle Martinez, who wrote Abuela's Greatest Gift. So we're so grateful to have you all with us here today. I'm not going to keep talking. I'm going to pass on the mic to Sericia. Thank you so much. And we're all looking forward to it. Thank you. Yay, Memphis, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Am I on mute? No, I took myself off mute. Okay. Um, wow, I'm so excited to, to chat with all of these wonderful contributors. And I'm so excited to hang virtually with all of you from wherever you're tuning in from. So make sure you let us know in the chat. I am streaming from the Bronx, the Boogie Down Bronx. Uh, Zakia, where are you streaming in from? Hi, I'm streaming in from Flatbush, Brooklyn. But Bush, <laughs> Evie, where are you streaming in from? I miss Flatbush. Um, I'm coming from Maplewood, New Jersey, the Maplewood. suburb. I got priced <laughs> out of Flatbush. So hey, Sagia, so, um, <laughs> sending love to Flatbush. <laughs> and Janelle, where, where are you streaming in from? I'm streaming in also from the BX. So. From the from the Bronx, we got the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Jersey represented tri-state area. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I am so excited to talk to all three of you. Of course, you are all black, so I feel like we get to really talk about some topics that I probably couldn't with some of the other contributors. So we are re really going to dig into it tonight. Um, I am coming off of the CNN interview that, you know, headlined <laughs> bleach, ble you know, Latinos using bleaching cream on their skin. And let me tell you, it has ruffled so many feathers in my family personally. And it's just been really interesting for um, siblings and, and just family members to reach out and, and question my own memory of my childhood and, and what I experienced. And so um, I kind of want to talk on the topic of truth in memory really quickly, because I feel like we were all you know, writing about topics from our lives during a global pandemic. And so while I was dealing with the trauma from having to uproot my life and change so many different routines, like going into the office, you know, going, riding the subway and et cetera. You know, it, we all just had to sort of stop at the drop of a dime and figure out how to readjust our lives really quickly because the world had essentially, essentially shut down. And then in the middle of that, you were also writing <laughs> this, this essay to this, to this beautiful um, collection that we put together. And so, you know, I think about a lot, like my memory of the last year, which is very hazy. And so a part of me is like, 
what parts, you know, really stick with you and, and the joys and the trauma is what really sticks with you, right? The stuff that's in between doesn't, uh, doesn't really happen that way. So I'm wondering if you can talk about your experience of what it was like for you to dig into your memory bank during, during the global pandemic. Um, and we can, we can start with you, Evie. Firstly, thank you again, Sericia. I don't think I've thanked you. Yeah. We've done panels before. I'm going to thank you again uh, for for putting together this anthology. And I feel a little bit more grateful that you invited a Haitian voice um, into this collection uh, for many reasons um, that I'll probably get into later on. Um, and thank you for including the Blackness part of the Latinx experience. Um, so for me, uh, in talking about, I, I don't, you know, me being part or adjacent to anything having to do with Latin culture is a little bit brand new to me. Uh, and for me, I had to pull into, from my childhood. Uh, while the conversation is not new, the experience is not new because I grew up around Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. And that's what I talk about in my essay, The Haitian Sensation. Uh, what did it mean? What it meant to grow up in an immigrant community, but within that immigrant community, realizing that Haitians and Haitian people were at the bottom of that hierarchy, and mm -hmm. it's still the case now. And for me, I had to remember how I didn't want to be Haitian as a child, and I had to let go of that shame to really unpack why that was. And it is. It was because of the media. And now the shame is not there anymore, but there is rage around how Haiti is presented in the media. Uh, and right now I'm also feeling a little bit of, of guilt because I feel like I still haven't write, written Haiti in the way that I want to write Haiti. Um, I have, but I haven't published. And for many years, I was not able to publish my Haitian fantasy novels, um, my Haitian stories because of how Haiti has been presented in the media. I think mm -hmm. um, editors and agents or what have you still want to read about the humdrum ex immigrant experience. I mean, like many um, of us in the Latinx or uh, immigrant populations, I, it's like we're trying to get to America or we're trying to cross a border. Uh, and I, I fell into that, not trap, but I ended up writing that immigrant, immigrant story as well. But part mm -hmm. of that writing that novel is waking up that part of me to say, I wanna redeem myself of those things that I felt in childhood uh, when I was a child because of the media. So I uh, thank you for that because I never really got to talk about how it was shameful to be Haitian in the eighties and I never really publicly said that I low key wanted to be Dominican, right? I'm like Haitian, right. Dominican, you Haitian? No, I'm Domin no, Dominican. <laughs> and I know so many um, young people do that. And I was able to unpack why that was in the essay. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course. And you know, a, a few people have asked like, or not, not even, they haven't asked, but a few reviewers have actually posted about what you're talking about, where they, where they listed out like, oh, um, you know, they have a Haitian, she, she included a Haitian writer. And um, I thought, you know, this writer was probably going to write about how they identify as being Latinx, but actually it was the complete opposite. And a lot of people were blown away that I included that, um, you know, in this, in this collection. And I thought it was really important to include because of course I had no idea where you were gonna go with your essay. I had sort of a broader sense of what you wanted to tackle and what you wanted to write about. But I thought it was really important because there are so many of us within, you know, this community that we we t we identify with what we want to identify with and then the other stuff we're like no thank you you know um and so i thought it was really important and i didn't see it as much of a difference of people saying they identify as chicana chicano chicanx you know or dominican saying like i identify as dominican they don't necessarily use the term latinx um and i thought it was important because i think that the history of knowing where you come from is equally important and just understanding like 
technically sure Haiti, you know, is a Latin American country and I can use the term Latinx if I want to, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have to. And so I thought, <clears throat> I thought it was important to show, especially young people that just because something is factual doesn't mean that you always have to embrace it um, that way. Um, Zakia, let's let's go over to, to you and, and talk about what your experience was like diving into your memory bank. <laughs> um, yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, as you know, and I feel like I've talked about a lot, um, my story changed a lot. I, you know, during the pandemic, my grandma, who is my, where my Cubanist comes from, um, moved in with us. And so I really kind of focused my essay on her to start. Um, but, you know, as we started talking about it and you were like, it needs to be more personal. I was like, all right, Cerise, I guess I'll dive into that and dig all, all of that stuff up. Um, but yeah, no, it was really interesting because I think, you know, I love my family. I love like the Cubanness of it. We're also Jamaican and like we've always been different colors and we like some of us speak Spanish, some of us don't. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to like dig into that and really dig into my insecurities because I think you know, in terms of how you're saying our memories are joys or they're like the sad part of it. I always associated my family with joy. Um, and that's still true. But I think as I started to dig into my memories, I was like, there were some things that I was like, you know, are different for me. Like I am the darkest skin of my grandma's grandchildren. You know, I don't have like a Spanish last name, like it's, and a lot of my cousins do. And so really digging into that aspect of it and just growing up and feeling a little bit different, um, that was hard. And that was why it was very scary to write this. Um, but thankfully you pushed me um, and, you know, digging into that. And then just the story that opens it with this guy that I knew in high school who questioned me being Cuban. Um, I really had to go into my memories and like dig out a lot of, of my insecurities. Um, but yeah, I hope that, you know, people who also kind of have those insecurities see that in this essay as well and realize that even though we might not always feel Cuban or Latinx, that we are anyway. Um, but yeah, it was definitely hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was hard. And you know, I want to talk about um, this a little bit more before before I jump um, to Janelle, because there are some people <laughs> who will find out, right, that they have ancestry, it, it, whether it's Latin roots or African roots, right? And they'll, they'll find it and they're like, okay, now I'm going to put claim on it. But then you have people like us where mm -hmm. you're, you grew up with your grandmother she helped raise you and like mm -hmm. that Cuban culture was ingrained in you and yet here you are a black Cuban who felt disconnected from your culture but you have these other people in the world who find out they have like you know one drop of something and suddenly they're like oh I'm Afro-Latina or I'm Latinx or I'm etc and you're like okay cool and that's no shade to the people who are tuning in if that is you I'm not calling you out but I'm just saying that like it's just a stark difference where you know you're actually being raised by by these people and it's really close to you but yet you still feel disconnected and you feel shame and you feel like I'm not Cuban enough I'm not Latinx enough so I'm not going to write about my experience growing up as a black Cuban instead I'm going to focus on you know, my grandmother and like my relationship with her. And I was like, well, Zakia, what are you, what are you walking away from here? Like, why are you skirting around these memories? Because the, the first draft of that essay was beautiful. And I think I told you that I was like, mm. wow, this is like a love yeah. letter to your grandmother. And I, and I think yeah. it's so beautiful, but I was like, where are you? You know, I'm mainly seeing your grandmother and I'm seeing your relationship with her, but I'm not really seeing you and what your experience has been like. And I thought that that was really important because there are so many people out there who 
are a part of these communities. They're, they are living in these spaces and yet they still feel disconnected. They feel out of the loop with their family. They feel out of the loop with their friends. And you, you just feel really awkward. You feel like the, the odd one out. And that's what I wanted you to tackle. And you know, I'm happy that we were able to hold hands and, yeah. <laughs> and you were able to walk through some of those memories to really talk about what it was like for you to, you know, identify this way and, and to figure out like, okay, what is it about this part of my identity that causes me to be insecure about it, you know? And even mm -hmm. before the essay, I remember having conversations with you just in general, talking about some of these things where you're like, you know, she just sprung on me guys that she was Cuban. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, <laughs> oh, and you latched yes. onto it immediately. You were like, like, oh, you're yes. one of mine. You were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, and we're here. Thing I you're like, a book. Yeah. I was like, we're here, this, this, I, I feel kinship, but I think it's really important because it's, especially when you are black and you know, you're in this community, you're, you're always being other, you're always being told you don't fit. You're always, you know, it's just, it's just the norm for us. And unfortunately we don't want that to be our norm, you know? So you, you kind of, it does feel uncomfortable to unpack that, but I'm so thankful that you did. And I think that the readers um, will read your essay and, and um, connect with that. Um, Janelle, <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna turn over to you and, and have you talk a little bit about your essay and, and what it was like for you to, um, to dig into some of those memories. Cause I think, you know, equally with your essay, it was a little bit of more of a journalistic style. And I was like, you gotta make it a little more personal. And so you flip the script a little bit, but I would love for you to talk about what it was like for you to dig into your memories. Yeah, and I would like to also say thank you for kind of pushing me to go there with like turning the lens on myself because I think as a journalist, I tend to like focus so much of my uh, style of writing and attention actually so to um, others. And so this was definitely um, a learning for me. Um, but in terms of the writing process, it was interesting because actually last year, um, you know, I, I start or at least speak to in this, um, in my piece about, you know, celebrating, you know, the life of my late grandmother. And last year, you know, I ended up lo uh, not losing, but the transition of my maternal grandfather. And so I felt like I was grieving and writing at the same time um, and how sitting with certain memories, um, you know, though some of them I was like, you know, you know, I have to go there, but other, I thought that it was great to be able to like begin healing, but also rewriting at the same time. Um, I will say um, with one reflection that came up for me in terms of talking about uh, the experience of like seeing my cousins dance, dancing punta and like a hesitation for me, I never, pinpointed the fact that I didn't jump in to dance as uh, the fact that like I felt different from them right because I danced punta a number of times like you know all like many many times but the fact that like I had to sit with some of those like realizations like wow this is about not just the fact that yes we're all garifuna but like the fact that I felt a conflict there with the fact that you know, am I Garifuna enough? Or, you know, I am American or all these different things. And so um, the process was definitely challenging to a degree, but also it was cathartic at the same time, being able to kind of sit with um, some of those memories. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, similar to, to Zakia, where she kind of felt disconnected, you and I, I think, feel like we have several conversations about what it's like to be Garifuna and, and also like have a disconnection from the language, right? Because we, we both don't really speak um, the language. But what I found so fascinating about your essay was, you know, just you being in, in the center or sort of like in, in the presence of other people. It's like you are watching you know the the beautiful magic of this indigenous culture that you you grew up with grew up in and and don't feel 
super close to but at the same time you're like this is mine it's so rich and it's so beautiful and um I just thought it was really really uh you did a fantastic job painting a picture of what it was like you know celebrating your uh, celebrate celebrating the life and and just the different practices and stuff like that because I feel like with Garifuna culture you know there aren't really any books written by Garifuna people about <laughs> this indigenous um, nation. And so I feel like people are always searching and most of the time getting it wrong and not really understanding our culture. And so for you to sort of paint it this way for the reader, where it's like you're in it, but you're also still learning about it. So they kind of get to go on this journey with you to see a peek into what it's like growing up this way. Um, and so I found that to be really, really beautiful. And I think in, in my essay, um, for me, <laughs> there were a lot of things that I probably, I was just texting Zakia before this. I was like, there were a lot of things I could have written a whole lot more about that time frame that I decided to focus on, which was, um, you know, at the age of like eight, all the way up to the age of being a teenager. Um, because lots of crazy stuff happened to me in my, in my life with just like racism, anti-Blackness and like other Latinos treating me like crap. And then like finding out that I was Latino and being like, oh, well, I guess we should embrace you because you're one of us. And it's this weird thing where I feel like, um, once you identify a certain way, people if they also share that identity with you they tend to embrace you and but if if they don't share it they're like okay I I can't connect with you because we don't have anything in common you know you're you practice a different religion or I'm straight and you're queer or you know you're black and I'm white and etc cetera, etc cetera. and I found that to be really interesting when I thought about my memories that like the question always came up of where are you you know where are you from um, cause it, it, it's kind of like, are they asking because they want to connect with me and, and like find that kinship or is it because I look weird, I'm awkward, or I, I, I seem out of place from what their, from what their normal thing is. And I found that as a, as a kid, it was terrible. Why were, uh, why are other kids asking me <laughs> these questions? And of course I didn't have the answers. And so I always turned, I found myself turning to someone else to figure out who I was. And I think for me, a lot, like a lot of the time growing up, that's just how it is, right? Like as a teenager, you kind of like want to be like your best friend or, you know, want to be like the popular person. So you tend to, to latch on. I mean, Evie, you talked a little bit about it when you said that you want, you didn't want to be Haitian. You, you wanted to identify as Dominican. Zakia, you talked a little bit about it where you, you're, where you were saying you felt shame and, you know, you're like, how do I connect? And Janelle, in your essay, you also talked about it because you were like, okay, when people ask me what, you know, where I'm from, I can either say I'm black or I'm Hispanic or, you know, I'm African-American, like all of these different things because people are always asking us, but I feel like white people don't get that. And so I'm wondering for you, do you think that it's our job, <laughs> that it's our job to sort of educate people and, and tell them like, this is who I am or do you just feel like, I just want to live my life? And like, that's that. Because to me, I feel like people are always interrogating. They, they always want to know. And it could, be curi it could be curiosity, but for the most part, it's not. For me, I always feel like they're finding a way to judge me or to other me, right? To fit me into a certain box. So I'm wondering for you, and I know this is such a complex question to answer, and it totally depends on the environment, but let's, let's keep it vague in general. Like, <laughs> do you feel like it's on you to, um, educate people when it comes to your culture specifically? So like, um, you know, EB, you being Haitian, Zakia, you being Cuban and Jamaican and, and Janelle, you, you know, being Garifuna by way of Honduras, do you feel like you have like a sense of responsibility to make sure that your story is straight in a sense? and anyone can can jump in that feels pulled to answer. Well, I'll start first. Um, 
That's a good question, Saracia. Um, I think I don't feel the need to educate because I think that's exhausting. Um, I, I will answer questions, but I won't volunteer information. Um, mm -hmm. I think social media encourages that, but I'm tired <laughs> after <laughs> the year and a half that we have. I realize that people are gonna come into your identity with their own experiences, with their own pers um, perspectives. And being that my debut novel was about a Haitian immigrant, I think people saw me as a Haitian immigrant and a mom as if I've just been Haitianing and momming for the last, you know, however many years I've been alive. But I don't think within the space of, and the space that we would be educating people is for me, my, my author space, the space right. where I have this platform. And for me, I don't, I realized coming into the space, I didn't get to be other than anything other than a Haitian immigrant. And it's a label that's on my forehead. And if I step outside of those, that, that identity boundary, I think people are confused or people don't believe me. Uh, I am Haitian immigrant and I also love science fiction. I also love African cultures and I call myself a Pan-Africanist in that I, I connect to African cultures because I connect to Haitian culture. If you know anything about Haitian culture, you cannot deny African cultural retentions. And I believe that's the same for Cuba and the Garifuna. You cannot deny that once I dug into my history and the traditions that we have, it's hard for me to separate that. So mm -hmm. if I write about African traditions, it's because I am Haitian. If I love sci-fi, believe it or not, it is because I am Haitian and that's a whole nother conversation. So all of these are part of my identity, but um, not, but, and they, my identity serves as a foundation for all of these things. Uh, so I don't feel the need to educate. I just feel the need to show and constantly show. I feel like I will always have work or, and I will always make art because I'm always peeling away at the layers of myself that people have not seen or refuse to see. Uh, so that. in that sense, I don't have to educate. I, I just have to make art. You know, I, I think, I think readers just don't know what I'll do next. Cause there's a part of myself that you don't see yet. Um, if you're paying attention, you will see the sum total of me, but if you're not, and if anybody is coming with biases or misunderstandings, I think for all of us, we will continue to surprise people, right? We will com continue to baffle people with the layers of us. And that is the fun part, you know? That's why I love being a woman of color. You just don't see the many layers of us. And therefore I get to surprise myself and others. I love that. I love that. Zakia Janelle, do either of you want to add or <laughs> we, we can also move on to the next question. I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I agree with Evie. I think for me, I mean, one thing I always say is Google is free. Um, so <laughs> I don't feel the need to educate people. Um, but I do think, and I hope that the work that I do just in general with my writing and with everything else um, that I am giving people a glimpse into my cultures, like being Cuban and Jamaican and just Black in general. But yeah, I don't feel like it's my job to educate people. I think if people actually want to learn, they will do the work to do to learn. I love that. How about you, Janelle? Yeah, I would agree um, both with Evie and, and Zakia in that um, I feel like the work is really an entry point into learning and education. Um, I will say though, in the past, because oftentimes people were so disconnected from understanding about Garifuna culture, I did for a long time feel like I had to, you know, step in and really like speak at length about it. But I also then realized that at the end of the day, other people have to, um, because yes, Google is free. And also I think sometimes other communities, um, or what I find very interesting is that as Black people, we oftentimes don't have the luxury of not knowing, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I just ask that other people, other communities come to the table as well with that same respect and understanding of like 
okay, I have heard of that or like do some form of like research before, you know, expecting the labor of, of others. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for answering that complex question. Now I want to jump to some some craft um, some craft questions. So I feel like with shorter pieces like essays or short fiction, it's always really hard for me to nail the opening. So I'm going to go through and just sort of read the first couple of sentences of um, um, your essays, and I'll do it in order. So. The uh, first person up is E.B. <laughs> so this is a quick excerpt from um, Haitian Sensation. And so I'm just going to read the, um, the first two sentences because they it's so impactful and I feel like it sets the tone for the entire essay. The first time someone called me a Haitian booty scratcher was in elementary school. I don't remember what grade, but it was in the 80s at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic a disease that the Center for Disease Control blamed Haitians for. And I just felt like that opening, that opening kind of just tells us right away as a reader, right? That there's pain there, right? The first time someone called me a Haitian booty scratch, it was in elementary school. Like, I feel like black children <laughs> are always treated terribly in the US. And, and so to have your essay open with that sentence just kind of set the frame for me. Like you're a child and, and, and people are calling you Haitian booty scratchers, whether it's an adult doing it or another kid doing it, it still hurts all the same. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, how you came to, to you know, using that as, as the opening? Was it very strategic for you? Did you want to like open with that? I'm also gonna jump to the end after this so that people can see how the essay ends just to see how it started and how it ended because it's, it just blows my mind. But um, what do you have to say about that, that Evie, that first line? Thank you. I don't know when I thought about it, but I had to include, oh, no, no, no. It, the essay was going to be called Haitian Booty Scratcher. I remember and, you wanted that as the title. And I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> it, it just was just, it invoked too much pain. Um, and it is painful. Thank you for pointing that out. And I have to point out that it was other Black children saying this to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we talk about enough about that sort of dynamic. Um, I did not grow up in white spaces at all. Um, I grew up with other kids of color. And I know for a fact that Haitians were at the very bottom of that hierarchy. Yeah, of course, you had your Black American kids. Um, mm -hmm. Then you had your Latin um, Latinx girls. And I talked about that in my essay. But boy, we got the brunt of it from the Jamaican kids. I love Jamaican people, but boy, they were cruel. <laughs> um, so in that sense. And then the other Black children being really cruel about mm -hmm who I was and my culture so that I felt like I had no other choice than not to be that, right? And this was around the time when there were Haitian boat people. So it was either you were a African booty scratcher or a Haitian mm -hmm. booty scratcher. And all those, like those two cultures, it's like the, it's the foundation for blackness, right? Of course, Africa, any country in the African continent and Haitian being the first country to successfully um, overthrow their masters, like the first free republic, black republic in the world, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think, and it's not, the, the onus is not on the other black children, the onus is just teachers, education and the media. And Absolutely. children are gonna do what children do, do, um, do. they're gonna absorb all of, all of those negative connotations and uh, fling them on each other. So it, it was painful to hear that constantly. I remember a little girl asking me like, I'm gonna have a, I, I just remember her at her, her face, the tone, and you know, when painful things happen in childhood, you, they stick to you. Yes, but she they was do. just like, you, you can't come to my party cause you Haitian. What? And she was like, Haitians don't eat barbecue. You eat cats. <laughs> just, the, just the most weirdest things, you know? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I could laugh about that, but yes, I had to start with that derogatory term 
um, mm -hmm. even if I didn't call it, um, make it the title, um, I had to open up, but that it coincided with what was happening in the media at that time. Yes, absolutely. And it was it was very powerful. Um, and so now I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, the ending of, of your essay. So this is somewhere within the last um, paragraph. I am Haitian. Simply claiming a Haitian identity includes my birth, my birth country's long and troubled history with France, its colonizer. It's a history that is in my bones and blood. I am also culturally American. It's an existence I can't deny either. Though what grounds me in all these intersections in my identity is that I am black and African first, whether it's in America, Latin America, or Haiti. It's what the world sees and it's what I know and feel and remember. And so I feel like in the beginning of your essay, we're dealing with the trauma and like, as you continue in your essay, you talk about, you know, wanting to disconnect and, and not identify as um, being Haitian because of everything that was happening in the media. But then towards the end, you know, you're embracing your identity. And, you know, I tell people this all the time. First and foremost, my Blackness appears in every, every touch point of my life. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was fighting for a promotion at work. And I, I told my manager at the time, I said, this is a race thing. And she said, it's not race. And I said, how are you going to tell a black woman that race is not involved in this? Because I am a black woman and every part of my life, race is a part of that, right? And so it, was, it just made me think, you know, the way you ended yours, I am black African, you know, like first, because that is what people see at face value. Um, but the other thing about that ending that I thought was really interesting that I would love for you to touch on a little bit is your Haitianness, but then also your Americanness, because I feel like um, there's, you can, you know, there's just so many different types of um, blackness, but then so many, so many different types of like Haitian people, right? Like how you said, like, Haitian immigrant, but then like a Haitian American, though I know you're not Haitian American because you weren't, you weren't born here, but you still, you grew up here. And so you embrace the American culture or it just, it, it's impacted you in your life and you can't deny it. You're right. There is just certain, you know, idioms or certain speech patterns, whatever it is, it just, it just, it's a part of who, who we are. And, you know, so I would love for you to talk about that a little bit. So I, I've gone back to Haiti and in Haiti, I am blanc. Blanc means white, right? I think in other oh, wow. countries, um, they say that, like I went to Senegal, they do have like a term for white people. And it doesn't mean that you're white, white. It's also encompasses being a foreigner. So in, in Haiti, of course, and I'm sure we all will have that, have, will have that experience when we go back to our home countries. I'm not Haitian. <laughs> I'm not Haitian at all. Like to them, of course, you know, I can speak the language in the Creole. Um, so in terms of that, I have to take a look at the history of Haiti where there were natives here, you know, there were there in Haiti, there were Arawaks and the Taino and the blacks were, you know, black people, African people were brought to the continent. And I'm also American in that everything that you said, I'm absorbing American culture. I know more about um, African-American history than I know about Haitian American, Haitian history because of documentation, because of mm -hmm. photos, um, because of access to information. Haitian history is an oral tradition. So all of that is my part of my intersectionality. That's all it is. And one does not negate the other, but there is no denying that I am black first. Um, and my blackness is rooted in Africanness. And because I, I don't like to always claim blackness, I prefer Africanness in terms of blackness is the opposite of whiteness. And the blackness part of it is the social construct, it's the American social construct. construct. Mm -hmm. In Haiti, you're not just black, you are like, you hold on. There's so much there that is rooted in African tradition, the food, the language, um, the customs, that is not just black. Black does not mean anything in a place like Haiti. Um, so in, the, in terms of that, I'll say, yes, I am Haitian, but part of being Haitian is being rooted in African cultural traditions and culture. 
I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing it. And the key thing to take away for all of those tuning in, you don't have to negate these things. I think that was like the most important part because we'll feel like we, we have to like cut off certain, you know, certain aspects of ourselves, but we don't. Um, next, I'm going to jump to Zakia. Uh, so this is the, the, the opening of Cuban imposter syndrome. Growing up on Long Island, my high school was more diverse than others, but still overwhelmingly white. So when a new guy in school mentioned he was Cuban, I couldn't help being excited. I'm Cuban too, I said without hesitation. Now I can't remember so clearly the look of skepticism on his face and in his voice when he said, really? I'm gonna stop there. But that's um, a couple of sentences in. And so for me as a New Yorker, <laughs> Having you open up and setting the scene in Long Island, I immediately, I, I, I was like, okay, I know what this is. But then you, you tore down that image in my head when you said, my high school was more diverse than others. And I was like, oh, okay, so maybe this isn't going to be what I think it's going to be. But then you said, still overwhelmingly white. And I was like, okay, now, now we're back to the vision I have in my head. <laughs> so I feel like you did a really good job of like setting up the reader to believe like, oh, this is, this might be different, but actually it's not. It's, it's exactly what you think it's going to be. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how, how you know, how you decided to open up with that sure. for your essay. Uh yeah, I I feel like I changed the opening a lot, um, but I realized this story, yeah, <laughs> you know, but I felt like this story really like kicked off like the imposter syndrome. Like I think, and I talk about this further into the essay, but like, you know, being at home and with my family and like, I purposely put in the part about my school being more diverse than others because I, my friend group was like Latinx people, black people like that. Like I did not grow up where it was like all my friends are white. So I, having this person kind of question my identity, that was really like the first time that I remember where I was like, wait, like, am I not Cuban enough? Um, and so I really felt like that was the best way to kind of set the scene and the stage for this essay because the, the whole essay is me kind of growing up and kind of deciding for myself what being Cuban means. Um, but the questioning I felt really started there. Yes, absolutely. And you you just kind of segued way into the ending of your own essay, which I'm going to quickly read for everyone. Um, and so this is sort of like the second to last paragraph um, all, all the way down at the page. I'm, I'm saying this as if people are reading along with me, but they might be, so who knows? Uh, so here goes. Moreover, I am Afro-Cuban. I am proud to be both Black and Cuban proud of the resilience that got all sides of my family from the African continent to Cuba, Jamaica, and the US, and proud of our shared history. It is that pride that I cling to whenever my imposter syndrome attempts to knock me down, because as long as I know where I come from, I know exactly who I am. Um, and so in the beginning, like you said, you you that was sort of the setting for your imposter syndrome, but once you work through your essay and, and this ending, again, similar to Evie's um, essay, you, you kind of like take a stance and you're like, I know who I am and I'm proud of this history because I know where I come from. So can you talk about why you decided to end your essay that way? Yeah, so um, going through it, I, I talk about how kind of like what Evie was saying about being African or like having that Africanness. Like I grew up really feeling like that part of me came from my dad's side of my family. Like that, like he is very much like all that side of the family is black, like from the South and then they came up North, like all of that um, being African-American. But when I thought of like my mom's side of the family, which is Cuban and Jamaican, that's how I saw it. Like I saw them as Cuban and Jamaican. Like I didn't see any kind of Africanness there. Um, but as I kind of worked through that and like understood our history and that we all came from there, like that's why we look the way we do and we are black um, and kind of understanding that like every part of me from all sides of my family is connected to that history. That's really where I kind of grounded myself and like I found like that pride in my history 
and who I am and what that means. Um, Cause I definitely think I separated the Afro part of Afro Cuban. And now I make sure to include that because that is a huge, like I'm not just Cuban, I'm Afro Cuban. Um, and really standing in that makes me feel very secure in my identity. I love that. That is amazing. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to jump over to Janelle's, uh, an excerpt from Janelle's Abuela's Greatest Gift. So I'm going to read um, sort of like maybe the first paragraph because this opening is interesting. I had to mentally prepare myself for my 2009 trip to Honduras. And I just have to say like 2009 Honduras, was all, there was also a lot of ruckus happening um, during during that time frame, but I won't jump into that. But as someone who knows the history of Honduras and what happened in 2009 and 2010 and what, you know, politically what was happening in the country, it was such a hot mess, y'all. So as a Honduran who knows the history, that sentence alone is very powerful because it kind of sets you up to like, this person is going into this country during a time where things were not so great. Um, and then here's the next paragraph. While I enjoyed catching up with family over Hudutu, endless glasses of freshly squeezed Guanabana juice, slipping into an afternoon nap in a hammock or daily walks on the beach, this particular visit home would be different. My abuela, Gregoria, wouldn't physically be there to greet us when the truck pulled up in front of my family's Sirabora. How do you say that? Sirabora? I always pronounce it wrong. Uh-huh. Yeah. Home. No um, a year after her passing, my family traveled from the Bronx, as well as different parts of Honduras, to my father's hometown for her buleria. I'm going to stop there because you go into, like, the, the customs and I don't want to give that away but can you talk about why you decided to um, start with that opening there yeah I think that opening came I'm pretty sure after our kind of think <laughs> around the note um, for my initial um, draft and that from what I remember I included portions of that in a certain part of the essay but it felt right to like bump it up because you know I'm speaking about the impact of um my abuela and then also um be through this very important point um though I always you know understood my daddy punanes I think when I sit with like the memories of how pivotal that specific trip was um, from the fact that like, you know, I didn't grow up seeing my paternal grandmother all the time like I did with my maternal abuela, but it was like always looking forward to that moment. Like, you know, I remember she would have Hudutu ready, she would have, you know what I'm saying? So knowing that this trip was like, all right, it's not gonna be the same. She's not gonna, it's be, gonna be different, you know, yeah. waiting. Um, and then also just the fact that she wasn't physically there but through her, you know, spiritual transition, how, you know, how that impacted me, the fact that like, I, from that moment on, I feel like I felt very led to dive even deeper into our culture to ensure that like I was finding ways to like archive, you know, um, to write about our culture. And so I think that trip really um, changed the way that I was was moving in terms of my understanding and writing about, you know, the culture. And so I think it made, as I was writing other aspects of this, it just made so much sense to like leave with To that. start there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna jump to um, the ending. Uh, so this is a few paragraphs up. Ancestral memory, unexplainable connections made that are too coincidental to pinpoint. Courage to speak our many truths lineage, the understanding that we've been and will always be, love of self and our people, Garinangu, Waiga, Suan, Dan, oral traditions that exist in our recipes, healing modalities, our, sorry, our stories, our native tongue, survival for the times past, present, and future that we've made it through. 
these are their these are their greatest gifts to me and just as they did i will pass them on and then some to those who come after and so i feel like your openings you know centers the reader about this loss that you're experiencing and then of course your essay takes us through all of the different memories that you have growing up and that you've experienced with your family and your and your grandmother and then at the end you're, you're bringing it home. So um, wh why this ending? You know, I was, I think I also too, I don't want to call it a struggle, but I really was thinking to myself, like, how am I going to close it? And I had to sit with the fact that, you know, what are these lessons? What are things that have been imparted um, upon me by, you know, both of my abuelas, my bisabuela, my aunts, right? Because I think that through them, um, particularly like, you know, ancestors and elders, like all of them, they have just been such um, a pivotal part of my life. And so it, it, I was thinking to myself, like, what are things that I carry with me and that I want, you know, my future, you know, children and, future family, you know, to also bring with them. So it was me sitting with that and, and thinking about like, just how impactful, you know, what they have given to me, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I love that ending, because you're, you're paying homage to your, to your ancestors, which, in a way, I feel like each of each of your essays sort of, sort of uh, did that. Uh, I just realized I skipped over myself. So I'm going to quickly read mine. <laughs> Uh, so this is a quick excerpt from Half In, Half Out, Orbiting a World Full of People of Color. Uh, so my opening sentence is, when I was born, I came out red. The way my mother tells it, I came out blood orange. I'm not sure what the doctors thought as they looked up at my parents, a Black man as dark as the inside of an endless pit with slick wavy hair fit for an Indio and a brown woman with thin penciled in lines for eyebrows and thick black corkscrew curls. And I feel that was important because honestly, I'm still fascinated about my birth story. And I really do talk to my mother about it randomly all the time because she 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 tells me like, when you came out of me, like I was so scared because you know, you were, you were so red, like, unbelievably red and I was her you know I was her um fourth child and so no her fifth child excuse me and she's like I you know I've never <laughs> I've never experienced something like this before and I think it's just a reflection of like my indigenous roots because I you know my father it has um indigenous roots from the south and also traces we can trace the slavery route um there as well and so I will one day when I'm ready dig into that history um but so seeing, you know, hearing that story from my mom really freaked me out because I was like, am I an, am I an anom anomaly? Like, was I that different from my other siblings? But then I also found it to be really fascinating because if you, if I were to show you a picture of my dad, who's like seriously like the blackest man I've ever seen, but then had this slick hair. And, 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 and that right away would tell you that like, Yes, he's black, but like there's something else here. And, and I, I, I think about that a lot because in my identity and throughout my essay, it's those type of tells where people kind of would assume like, oh, you, you aren't African-American. They would specifically say that, like, you're not just African-American. You have to be mixed with something else. They would always refer to the hair on, either on my body. So like my arms, because apparently I have really straight arm hair, whatever that means. I didn't put that in my essay, but I should have because it was one of the weird quirks as a kid that kids would point out. And the other thing would be like, oh, you have good hair. And I would always be like, well, what is good hair? You know, like, what does that, what does that even mean? Um, but according to these kids, and like Evie said, they were, they were always other Black kids. It was always other Black kids telling me Basically, I wasn't black enough because I looked different. I didn't look the same type of black that they were. And um, I just thought that was interesting. So I wanted to intentionally mention that because you see the melding of like this really dark man with this, with this brown woman. Um, and then similar to actually all of your essays, the way I closed was sort of like coming to terms with my identity. 
but I finally had, I finally truly have a sense of who I am, a black indigenous Honduran woman. And I vowed to never deny parts of myself for anyone, but instead to lean in plant roots and let the history of my ancestors live on through me by sharing what I've learned about us with my son and my future children. I'm proactively having conversations with my siblings and discussing things about our childhood, how we were raised and the things that society forced on us so that we don't make the same mistakes with our own children. I've been invested the time in explaining to young people in my family that they can be more than one thing no matter what the world dictates, no matter what other Black or Latinx people tell them. Only we can tell the world who we are, but first we must learn where we come from. And so even though everyone's essay came in at a different time, I feel like our endings just sort of lined up at the end, uh, which I which I found to be really interesting. And for me, it was important to end that way because for the longest time I I just felt so lost and I feel like so many young people feel lost when it comes to grappling with identity when it comes to trying to figure out your place in the world when it comes to fighting for what you believe in whatever it is you know people just kind of like count you out write you off and they're like you're just a child and you know I try not to use that language I try to instead listen because I remember what it was like to be really young and to have those questions and to want answers. And though I'm not gonna lie, sometimes when these children ask questions, it is highly annoying, but it's on us to take the time to really, you know, be patient and explain and share this knowledge because we, we've, we've learned a lot. We've been through a lot and, and we have to like, you know, like Janelle said, pass down those oral stories. Like Evie said, you know, let, let, let them know this is where you come from. And now you have the opportunity to identify how you want to. Um, and, and I find that to be beautiful. So I just want to thank all of you. Oh, go ahead, Evie. <laughs> Before you close out, I do want to say something about what you just said about your father. And oh, yeah. as I brought up hair in my essay, um, I did not realize how diverse we can be even on the African continent. Uh, yes. That there are like whole like um, ethnic groups that look like, you know, I would went to Africa and I'm like, you look Dominican, <laughs> you know, but you're, you know, they'd be Fulani or something like that. But I have seen where on the African continent, they're very dark with silky hair. Um, yes. You know, Saricia, you could be Somalian or Ethiopian, you know? <laughs> um, when oh, when I tell you, like, <laughs> it's, it blows so, my mind. It's right. very fascinating. So part of educating ourselves and help educating young people is to, like, not put those hierarchies in terms of Blackness, because I think that's, that's where, like, white supremacy has indoctrinated us into exactly. thinking that they're this having really tight coils or very dark skin, you are authentically black. But if you look Latinx or Afro Latino, that's like you're away from that sort of blackness. I'm like, have you gone to these places? I went to Senegal and they're like, are you from Cape Verde? And I'm like, Cape Verde. And I saw some Cape Verde and I was like, oh, I see. <laughs> they, you know, they look like me and I look like South African women too. So that's yeah. the beauty of diaspora, how we look in the diaspora, like we can really be almost anywhere. So that's why I will claim that blackness first. And then historically speaking, I think um, connecting to a colonizer comes second or third and where I grow up comes last, so to speak. So that's the beauty of us. I just wanted to add. Absolutely, um, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, but I was just gonna say, we do, we do have a couple of questions. So I first wanted to just thank each of you so much for your contribution to this wonderful collection. It was super important to me to highlight black voices from you know, Latin American countries because we definitely never get the space and, and now we have the space. Um, and so I hope all of the folks that are tuning in that you definitely pick up your copy from Word Up and, and have the opportunity to read because all of our cultures are so diverse and so rich. And um, I really do think there's something in here for everyone. Um, and let's see, first question. Sorry, my eyes are like, 
going in and out. Okay. What was the most surprising part of the whole writing, editing, editing, publishing process? Does anyone want to take that question? I guess I can go for it. <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't know. Um, we kind of, <laughs> I mean, we kind of like talked on this a little bit though. Um, but go ahead, Takia, you can go. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, yeah, we definitely talked about it. I think, um, especially for this anthology, it was interesting because obviously we had an editorial process, but then we had like the editors have another editorial process. So, and I think we talked about this a little bit, how it was just interesting, how like obviously you caught things, but then they also caught things. So it was, it was actually really nice having like three pairs of eyes on this um, because there was just so much, like every single draft, I think it got better and better. Um, so I think that really surprised me just like, cause I know that there's obviously an editorial process, but I don't think I realized like how much, like, especially sometimes just little things like would be like, mm, what if we just change the sentence a smidge? And it's like, oh yeah. wow, like you are absolutely correct. That's crazy. Um, uh, so I think that really surprised me. Yeah. yeah. EB, Janelle, any? Yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to say that, um, I think Theresa, you and I spoke about this, but, um, including uh, Garifuna words in the oh, piece, yes. as well as like, yeah, this, I think it was more so the wording, um, you know, even if you, like, for example, I don't know, Sarisa, you were like, oh, you know, we were, there was a point where we were like fact checking something. And then I was like, oh, let me hit up my mom. And my mom was like, yeah, you know, this is it. Like, blah, blah, blah. Then she hit up my my abuela and my abuela was confirming and then I was like well let me hit up <laughs> my one other boy. person yeah and I'm like so like in your family I was like because I know we say it this way like do y'all say it? and also just the fact that like it is really like you know when we each spoke about like oral tradition and oral history like a lot of this is passed on and so it is very um challenging to find consistent wording and um, I think that like, I know we probably both felt this, but like pressure to, um, sorry, there's like a random vibe, um, <laughs> but like pressure to get it right, you know? Um, and I think that it was really, I appreciated the fact that like, you know, as being someone that is also Garifuna, like I felt like maybe there would have been more questions had it not been like working with you on this, but then also too was refreshing to be able to like, you know, bounce certain things um, off of you. But I think that that was kind of like something to be mindful of was like, wow, like, you know, I hear this term often, but like, is it spelled this way? Like yeah. I was thinking of like Palmo, I'm like, Palmo, like, is there an accent? Like, you know, it's just like, you hear yeah. it, but like, you don't know. So yeah, that was interesting. Nope. Yeah, and I think for me, that was sort of one of the interesting things in the editorial process where um, I think you get like these proofs of the pages and we go over different words and accents and things like that with the um, proofreader and copy editor. And, you know, they're pushing back to, because we want to make sure these things are factual and correct for the readers. And because there were all of these different Latin American countries represented, there were different dialects of Spanish that were used in certain um in certain places, but then also just different names of fruit that belong to different countries. So just making sure that stuff was also laid out correctly. Um, we're, I'm just gonna ask two more questions and then I think we can sort of um, round out here. Um, so thank you for this phenomenal panel. I'm curious if how the process of writing your essays for this book impacted any other projects you're working on or wanting to work on in the future. I will say immediately for me, since writing, I've I just been on a nonfiction kick and I'm actually writing several essays that have to do with different um, different challenge points in my life because I'm trying not to use the word trauma anymore, but different challenge points and different um, points of joy in my, in my life. Um, but I don't know if anyone else, if writing this nonfiction piece inspired you to write anything else. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it inspired me to write something else, but I am trying to write a book. Um, I know because <laughs> I know Cerise is like, yes, yes, you are. Um, but I'm waiting. No, I, <laughs> I know. Um, but I do think like, because um, this is a book that I've been drafting a while and now I'm like, I do want to make sure I'm including that the character is Cuban. Um, like, not that it has to be in a very prominent way, but I do want to make that part of her character because um, I think previously she was just black which is totally fine but I think especially going through writing this essay I do like you said we don't have a lot of representation especially for black Cubans specifically so I do want to put more out there in my work I love that EB Janelle did you have anything to add no okay um and then well we kind of already answered this question but the last thing I'll say to, to each of you is where where can they find you? Where where can people find you online? What's what's the next project that you have? The next project for me is just this. I'm gonna be rocking this baby all year long and into 2022. Um, and you can find me online at SJ underscore Fennell, and that's across all social media. Um, so come come hang out with me online. <laughs> um, where can they find you, Janelle? Yeah, folks can find me um, at JanelleMartinez.com. My social handles are linked there. So, um, you know, one-stop shop. So I look forward to like connecting with folks. I love it. Um, and EB, where can people find you? I'm gonna do what Janelle uh, did. Yeah, one-stop shop, ebzaboy.net. Um, I am on Instagram only uh, for now. Pictures, <laughs> I need just pictures, not too many words. Um, but e Instagram at ebzaboy dot, um, what is Instagram? At ebzaboy. <laughs> at ebzaboy, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Zakia, what about you? Where can they find um, you? After, you? after you dragged me at our last panel for not having the same social handle everywhere, I do now. So it's <laughs> at Zakia and Jamal across all platforms. Um, so I don't get in trouble with Teresia. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was the publicist <laughs> in me. It was just like trap. Oh try no, and immediately, get, you're try like, your why <laughs> is it not the same? And I was like, you know what, Teresa, you are correct. I apologize. And I see you won't catch me slipping ever again. Never again. I'm, I'm happy that that worked out. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But thank you so much to, to our wonderful panelists. Thank you to uh, Word Up. They have signed copies. Um, there i went i went earlier this week to to hang out and sign there um oh memphis is back on the screen i'll let the, i'll let memphis wrap it up <laughs> well i just want to say that this was a really wonderful conversation and to thank you all for coming and you know in the ways you've all been a part of like you've become part of like the word up community you know we might have done events with you before but it's so great to have you with um with us here i was the lomas lit um our youth book club facilitator when we read this and there were just so many wonderful things and takeaways that we have with our young people uptown and it's so wonderful that you have joined us tonight and everyone else who's been in the audience and so if you felt like you learned something if you felt like something resonated with you where you think that if you put this into the hands of somebody else they would get something from it i can tell you as a as somebody who works with people and as a young person myself, I got something from it. Um, and so please, please, please pick up your signed copies at Word Up. You can catch us at our shop, 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at 165th Street, or you can also buy it online um, and, and keep this love train going, okay? Thank you all so much. Check out the handles of all of the panelists and check out their upcoming works and we'll see you next time. Thank Bye you. everybody. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.